Hello, my name is Graham Wynn. I'm the founder and director of Superior People Recruitment, and I'll be on the Prosperity Show today discussing AI technology and how its use or not use in the recruitment industry is changing things or can change things in the future. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And I'm your host, Prosper Tarovinga. I'm hoping that today is going to be a fantastic episode with Graham. Graham, how are you doing today? I'm very well indeed. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Now, for those that are tuning in for the first time, the Online Prosperity Show is a place where we explore secrets to success, growth, and prosperity in the modern world world and today our special guest graham is going to be joining us he he is an employment expert recruiter and the founder and director of superior people recruitment he believes in the human capital and we're going to be asking him questions about um you know his past his history and his take on how ai is literally um, coming into his space and how he feels about that. Now, Graham's extensive experience and expertise have made him a sought-after authority in the field of recruitment and employment, and hence the reason we've got him on the show today. And he's been featured on um, national talkback radio and major news channels, and today is here to share with us his uh, valuable insights with us. Now, Graham, welcome once again. Thank you. Good to be here. Absolutely. Now, before we dive into the world of recruitment and employment, let's learn a little bit about um, yourself there. You've had a diverse and extensive career in management consulting, and you've also held financial roles spanning various industries. Could you tell us a little bit more about your journey and what has actually led you to become a leading expert in the recruitment field? Sure. Prior to starting this business, I was the general manager for a number of different companies and organizations. And generally, when I went in there, you go in as a general manager to do one of two things, but mainly it's fix a problem. Otherwise, they don't need you. So generally, you're going to fix a problem. And what I used to always identify was the initial thing you have to fix is the people. You've got to get the right people in your business. If you don't have the right people in your business, it doesn't matter how good your product is, your services, your marketing tools are. If you have the wrong people, you have nothing. So what I used to always do is focus on, okay, let's see who I've got here working here. What are the skill set we need? What have we currently got? And I'll deal with that first. If that meant I had to change some staff over, so be it. But I needed the right people in to make the business work. So in the the role prior to me starting this business, I went into a company in the travel industry. They were losing considerable money. Um, And so I went in there with the mindset, of, okay, how do we fix this? So dealt with the people. Let's get the right people in. Then we looked at procedures, policies, systems, improved all them, and in a three-year period from from a million-dollar loss to a three-million-dollar profit, purely by just initially getting the right people in place. Uh, And that's what I've tended to do in the past. I think it comes from a a little bit of arrogance, for want of a better word, that I've always believed growing up I could do it better. Every company I worked for, I always thought I could do this better. And when you sort of progress through the businesses, eventually you get the opportunity to say, I can do this better, and that's where you go with it. And so my last two or three roles were, I was poached basically from other companies, and I left that travel company then to go and be a general manager of a training organisation. They poached me from the travel company. Same problem, making a loss. How do we make it better? First thing, get the people right. And that's really what I've stuck with the whole way through my working career. You've got to have the right people. I say it doesn't matter how good your product is. If you've got the wrong people, you're not going to make a business. The training company I worked for was there for about three years or so, and then the owners of that business decided to retire, and they offered it to me, and I said no, um, because I could see where the future of training was going, and it wasn't really a positive future for it. So I thought, no, I need to get out. What I liked about my work was the recruiting part of it. So I thought, okay, let's, let's go and get a job in recruitment as a pure recruitment person, and I could not get a job in recruitment. Most people in recruitment at that time were young and most of them female, of which I was neither. So I thought, okay, if I can't get a job in recruitment, then I'll start my own business. So whether against the arrogance, I don't know what it is, or self-belief, I just thought, well, if you're an employee, I'll start my own. And that's what I did, and that was only 15 years ago, basically. I had some clients who I had good relationship with from my other work, 
And so I approached all those clients and asked them, what do you or don't you like about the recruitment industry? I got some very, very good feedback, mostly negative, but it was still very good feedback to get. And I tried to deal with those issues they had and make it better. And that's how I started the business. And now we are here now 15 years later. Fantastic. That was such a journey. And um, I think in real, <clears throat> in real estate, they have a statement, location, location, location. And I think in your space, you will, um, you know, use the words people, people, people. And the one thing that really um, obviously sets you now apart in this recruitment sort of industry that you've now gotten in is your emphasis on building strong relationships because you really do value human capital and, um, you know, your relationships with clients and sourcing the right candidates um, who not only have the necessary skills, but also fit well within the company culture. Now, can you maybe share with us some unique insights into this unique approach and how it actually benefits both the business and the candidate um, that we yeah. you'll be sourcing for them? Yeah, well, we'll talk pre-COVID because obviously things change during COVID quite a lot. And what we would do with the new with the new clients, what I would always do is go and obviously meet the client, get a feel for the workplace, get a feel for the people they're working with, but also where will this new person be sat? Where is their desk? Where is their chair? I want to see exactly where that person's going to be based. And the example I give, a person was looking for an accounts person, admin person. When I went to sit in a manufacturing company, their desk was in an open plan office close to a lot of the mechanics, et cetera. A lot of foul language going on, screaming going on. I thought, okay, I cannot afford to put a, ma a quiet mouse in there. This needs a really strong character in there to deal with that. And that's what I then take away from those workplaces. What kind of person does it need? And I quickly learned in the industry that it's not always the best skill, best qualified. You've got to find the right fit. You must find that right fit as well. And that's what I've worked on. And the clients I now work with, trust me that if I send them a resume and say, this is the one you need to meet, they meet them. They don't question it now. So I've built that relationship with them as well. And they don't care if I'm working out of a, a garden shed or anything. They just trust me to do my job now. And don't question when I send resumes through. So they just say, yep, yeah, fine. If you send it through, we'll meet them. And I've worked on that scenario of quality rather than quantity. I don't send 10, 12, 15 resumes to an employer. I send two, sometimes three, sometimes only one. If I can't find what they want out of those two or three people, then there's a problem. Either I don't understand what they want or they didn't explain it well enough. A lot of my competitors I did discover when I did my research initially would be sending 10, 12, 15 resumes. And, and employers are saying, we may as well do it ourselves. We're paying you to find us the best, not find us 20 to pick from, but find us the best. So that's what I've really gone with, quality rather than quantity. So we focus on that. So it's about meeting the, the employer, finding it, getting a feel for them and the workplace and the environment and the culture, and then matching up the candidate with that. It's a bit like a dating agency in some way. That's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And you did mention, you know, the advent of COVID and how it sort of changed the way people were uh, viewed upon in terms of, um, you know, recruitment and things of that nature. Now, the world of work is constantly evolving. And in recent times, you know, we've had um, significant changes and challenges, especially from the pandemic. Now, have you maybe adapted your recruitment strategies to meet the needs of businesses and candidates in this ever-changing landscape? We had to, basically, yes. So it, the face-to-face -face meetings couldn't happen. So all our candidate interviews had to be done online. And a number of our clients also did that initial interview online as well. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I was using Skype before COVID for some people, um, purely because some people working full-time was very difficult to get to our office. So I do Skype interviews at night times or weekends because they're working full-time. And so I was using Skype for that sort of thing. But, and then when COVID kicked in, suddenly Zoom took over. So the marketing people for Zoom were geniuses because pre-COVID, nobody even knew about Zoom and now Skype completely pushed away. So genius marketing people for Zoom, definitely. Um, so a lot was done online and that's carried on. And we've found it quite beneficial to do a lot of interviews online because it's just, it's a quicker process. It's an easier process. Clients are far doing far more online. So we've lost that little bit of um, that fate, that sort of gut feel with some people. We still go and meet clients, of course, but the majority of our interviews with the candidates are now done online. 
But I think I've been doing this long enough to get a feel, even though it's online, for the type of person they are. I don't need to meet them physically to get a gauge the type of person they are. We'll still visit our clients to get a feel for the environment and culture at the workplace, but we can do much more candidate interviewing online. Absolutely. And obviously, all of this is being done online. And if you're going to be selecting through, um, you know, a lot of candidates, what sort of tools have you been implementing, if you can say, or maybe industry standard tools that uh, will help you sift through the barrage of candidates and uh, CVs that you might be receiving? I'm very old school in this in this regard. Um, I'm sort of fighting technology a bit on this one. And <laughs> I still look at every resume that comes in. I look at them all. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, the main one being that if a person applies for a job, they may not be suited to that particular job, but I might have another job that they could be suited for. Using technology, you won't find that. So I'm sort of steering about away from technology to sort of say, here's a resume, not what job have they applied for, but what jobs have I got this person could be suited to. So that's what I'm trying to use as my tools, if you like. So forget the job they apply for. What have I got that could work for this person? So that's probably one of the main tools we're using is ignore the job they've applied for. What have we got that can work for this person? And it's look, it's it's hands on that way. It's a little bit more time consuming, but I think it's far more effective. I can imagine. And um, I've heard that a lot of uh, recruitment agencies don't even read the resume. They have a, a tool that uh, separates, um, you know, the resumes up until they get the cream de la cream. That's the ones that they then view um, and then sort of invite for an interview. What's your take on that um, method of recruitment? Don't like it at all. Um, won't do it and unless I'm forced to. I, I just won't use it. I'll be honest with you. I think it's lazy recruitment that you're getting a machine to do the job for you. Um, so it's a la- so you can actually therefore employ in some way less experienced people because they're just pressing buttons. And, and the problem with that sort of system is if, if people go and seek as a main job board, for instance, apply for a job, it goes into the recruiter's database. If certain keywords match, it spits the resume out the other end. If they don't match, it doesn't. So a person never looks at the resume. So as I back to the example I gave, they could apply for that job, but be better suited to a different job. That won't happen because they're relying on a machine to say it matches the job they've applied for. And that's a problem. The other problem with this automated system is that a lot of times if people use fancy graphics or PDFs, a lot of these databases can't read those files. So consequently, you upload your resume into it and a lot of information gets lost. So again, it won't spit it out the other end. So that's, I think the technology might exist, but in this particular instance, I don't think it's the most effective. It's more efficient because you're seeing those resumes, but I'm not sure it's the most effective way of doing it because you're going to miss a lot of good candidates. Absolutely. And also, Graham, with the advancement of maybe AI, you know, we had to bring the elephant in the room. Um, there's a very big growing concern that AI might actually replace uh, human workers in various industries. Now, what are your thoughts on this potential shift in the job market? Look, it will definitely change certain industries. There's no doubt about that. And I think anything which involves a lot of written documentation, such as journalists, that kind of work, yes, it'll replace those. A lot of trades, hand jobs, no, it can't replace those for sure. But what it will do, though, it will generate other industries as with any technology new technology comes in some jobs fall away but new jobs are created this will be the same some industries will fall over but new technology creates new opportunities so it's about the job seekers looking ahead and saying where are we going in five years time what skill set do i need to adapt to that ever-changing job market my my industry I won't be out of a job with AI, that's for sure. (laughs) Definitely won't kill my industry. It'll certainly impact my industry because a lot of people who rely on technology, it will impact them. But as I'm not relying on technology, it shouldn't impact me. I think the danger from my industry's point of view with AI is people getting AI to write resumes for them, to write cover letters for them. That's the danger. Uh, And we like people to use our own words. Although it's, it's interesting in some way, going back many, many years when I was working for other people and doing recruiting, 
you would find some recruiters, if you ask for five or six resumes, every resume was on the same kind of template. They all looked the same. And the recruiters did that because they didn't want us to be able to differentiate against the job seekers. They all look the same. Therefore, the recruiter actually put the words in the resume themselves and therefore not the actual job seeker's own words. So all the resumes looked alike. I don't like that. I want to see what the person says about themselves. And you can normally tell if it's written by themselves or by a third party. You can normally work it out by how they write it. And particularly if you jump onto their social media pages, for instance, you can see, oh, no, you didn't write this one. Because <laughs> you can see the words they're using on social media. And you can tell us straight away, or if you go to their LinkedIn profile and you can see their work history on there, oh, that's different to your resume. No, you, you, some, someone else has gone on here. So if they're going to use AI for to write their resumes, they need to change all their profiles everywhere because otherwise they'll look very different and therefore we'll know, okay, this is not you. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the risk with AI for people getting to do their job application for them, if they do get the job, AI won't do the job for them. They're still going to do it themselves. So I think by trying to cheat the system, if you like, they're only hurting themselves because they'll get found out eventually. Ab absolutely. And obviously, like you are meant, obviously, like you're mentioning, um, you know, how you go onto somebody's social media to see if they actually say they are who they say they are, you know, it then creates that sort of mix or that co co company culture that is required in order for people to uh, then work together. I mean, while you emphasize the importance of finding the right candidates who actually fit well with the company mm -hmm. culture, what would you say to the argument that AI powered systems can actually efficiently analyze those social media platforms and also look at the co company's cultural fit um, and then make accurate hiring decisions. It can do things, but it can't do the one thing that I can do, and that's work on gut feel. It can't do that. And I, I rely on gut feel. I'm a bit sort of rotund, so I rely on my gut feel quite a lot. And I just think to myself that when I'm looking for staff for, for my clients, if I had that job working for me, would I employ this person? If I've got any doubt, then I won't put that person to my client. So that's how I try and look at it. Now, AI can't do that. It can't have that gut feel emotion that we have. So if I'm meeting somebody and I just get a gut feel, then I won't put them forward. Now, AI can't do that. It might be able to say skill set, experience, but it can't judge a character or read a person. It can't do that. And in recruitment, I'm in the industry of people. That's what I'm in the industry of. I sell people, basically. AI can't do that. It can sell skills, it can sell technology, but it can't sell people, which is what I do. My asset is people, and Absolutely. AI can never replace that. Absolutely, and I, I love the argument that you present there, uh, Graham, and thank you so much for uh, being a good sport on it. Now, you mentioned something that you know raises a lot of uh, concern, especially when you mention gut feel. Gut feel can also be tainted based on the kind of glasses somebody's wearing or whatever biases somebody might have. So even though the person or the candidate might be the perfect candidate for that particular job, but your somebody's biases might actually be against that sort of maybe person, the way they look, feel, the way they talk, the way they sound, or just how they approached on that particular day. So the use of AI in recruitment um, can maybe potentially eliminate that human bias and maybe improve diversity in the workplace. How do you respond to the argument that AI-based systems might be more objective and fair in evaluating candidates? Possibly, yes. So I'll, I'll give you that one. What I would say, though, is that every day of, the, of our life, Whenever we're around, we all do it. We all form an instant judgment of people. So we're all biased in some way. It's just a fact of life. We are, we look at people, we meet people, and you form an instant judgment. Everyone does it. So therefore, it's something which can't, which can't be ignored. You can't get rid of it because it's, it's in our makeup to actually form instant judgment on people. It's just how we're, how we're designed. 
So, so AI will not replace that. But could AI therefore alleviate that problem and not have any form of bias? Yes, it could. But then you still need to meet that individual person to see if their character personality still fits. So it might be able to shortcut and get rid of bias based on skill set, experiences, whatever, or does a person wear glasses, have they got hair or not hair? It can maybe get rid of all that sort of thing if they wanted it to. Although if, you, if you're putting that as a criteria for a job person, <laughs> there's a bit of a problem. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that, yes, it can shortcut that process, but it will never get rid of the fact we still need to talk to people and meet people. And, and part of the issue is that every employer has a wish list. Now, we cannot always advertise an employer's wish list because of legal reasons. But quite often, in the past, I've had people say, okay, they want a male or a female. They want a certain age range. There are certain nationalities they do or don't want to employ. So we get the information from the employer. Now, I could not pump that into a system because if that was found out, <laughs> there'd be legal issues. So we still need to have that human interaction to be able to gauge those things. And the reasons why people give me this such criteria, it's not about discrimination. It's not about bias. It's about them as employers knowing what their business needs. They don't see it as discrimination or bias. It's simply two examples I'll give you um, recently. I had a client with an open plan office, four or five females, all over 40. He just said, a 20-year-old won't work. It just won't work. So he wanted somebody over 35 because he thinks that person would fit better. Now, it could be wrong, but he believes that. So for his workplace, that's what he wants. The other example I had was a client who, had, uh, who said to me, do not send into this workplace anybody from Serbia, for instance. I said, why? He said, because they've been working closely with two people from Croatia. They will shoot each other. <laughs> <laughs> that now, would have been a bigger problem for the company, right? Yeah. Now. So every, every employer gives me a bit of criteria which you can't advertise, therefore you can't pump it into an AI system. You really only got to find that out from talking to people and meeting people and say, that's not going to work. Absolutely. And I, 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 I can visually believe that sort of, um, you know, cultural uh, misnomer where people don't actually gel on the outside and it will create an uncomfortable environment, especially if HR has to be involved every second day to deal with, um, you know, people um, fighting at work and everything else. But while you are advocating for finding the best fit between maybe the candidates and the company, like you say, you know, you, you know, a certain age group can't mingle with a certain age group. Just, it just doesn't, you know, gel. It's like oil and water there. How can you then maybe address the potential efficiency of maybe the cost saving benefits that AI presents, um, you know, in, in as much as if somebody is sitting on that desk for eight hours, that would maybe cost a company X amount, whereas whatever output they would have given can be replicated uh, by uh, AI for a cheaper uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, cost, even if they might not, um, even if AI cannot fully replicate human judgment. I suppose like I, it, it's a trade-off. Yes, AI could be a, a cheaper way, a more efficient way of, screening through resumes and somebody looking at all of them would be far more efficient and quicker. However, you would miss a lot of the candidates you could place in jobs. And by placing candidates in jobs, that's how I earn money. So yes, you could find a cheaper system, but would you actually lose income because you're missing some potentially good candidates by not looking at every single resume? So it's a bit of a trade-off, I think. But yes, perhaps the system we use may be more costly in the time of human hours, but it generates more income than AI would because we look at everything rather than just pick up bits and pieces. Absolutely. Well, let me tell you something, Graham. All work and no play makes Graham a dull boy. I've I've looked at I've looked you up and um, I've noticed that outside of your your professional life, you dealing with people and all this stuff, you are an avid collector of music. Could you maybe I share with sure, us yeah. an, an interesting fact or a story about your music collection and how it actually brings joy and inspiration to your life? Music is something which I have playing all day in the background. Um, I'd rather have music on than television. It's, it's a mood thing at times as well. I mean, I was 
born in the, in the early 60s, so I was in the UK in the early 70s, mid 70s, late 70s, when punk rock first came into play. And punk rock, to be in the UK at that time with Sex Pistols, what an amazing time that was. And I remember buying the Sex Pistols record and my dad saying, I know you've got the record, but if I see it or hear it, I'll smash it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've, I've bought music for lots of many, many years, I've gone to a lot of concerts in the past. I've got everything from classical and opera to heavy metal and everything in between, basically. And I, I just, just love music. But I find it, it's also quite a mood thing. So I'm reading a book at night time, just some nice background, peaceful, opera, classical music, beautiful. I've had a bad day at work, but punk rock comes out because yeah. it just clears your head of any thoughts. So it's, it's quite a good mood thing. It, it really can help lift or keep you in whatever mood you want to be in. And I just find it's something you can get really passionate about music. You can really feel it. And, and it just, yeah, I just love music, yeah. Absolutely. So do you have it in vinyl, in cassette, in DVDs? Or... Oh, I've got vi many, many vinyl records. Yes, so all my vinyl records I bought when I was growing up. I've still got them all. Wow. And with the, with the way vinyls come back, they're now all worth quite a bit of money as well. So it was a good investment <laughs> at the time. <laughs> So no, but I've still got all my vinyl records from when I was growing up, and I still look. I'm, I'm reluctant to buy vinyl these days because it's ridiculously priced. Um, it's so overpriced vinyl compared. To, um, but CDs are. I'm obviously moved to CDs once they came out. So there's uh, there's two or three thousand CDs in my pile, kind of thing. Um, I don't download music. I'd rather buy it. I'm, I'm a very tangible person. I like to feel things and touch things. And you can open up the thing and take the inserts out. Downloaded music. It's boring. Um, so no, I, I'm, I still like to buy things. I still buy books. I don't use Kindles or download. I still buy physical books as well to like to read. So I'm still very much a feel touchy, which probably transfers into my job that I like to look at every resume and feel it, not rely on technology to do it for me because that's just the kind of person I am. Absolutely. And your love of people has also helped you build such a strong network. And you also recommend that uh, people should build a strong network, um, you know, in, in order for them to be able to find the right opportunities. Now, how important is face to face networking, especially for job seekers? And what sort of advice do you give to those who are struggling to establish these connections in, in, in their desired industries? The connections are really important. And I think these days you've got to realise that there are a lot of networking opportunities, a lot of small small events around the city for businesses, professionals. Go along to them. Some are generic ones, some are industry-related. Go to them. But also use LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great tool. If you want a, if a particular company or industry you want to work in, you can go and find those people and companies on LinkedIn. You can connect to them. You can see what they're doing. And if they're then attending events, go along to award nights. It might not be anything you've got, you're going to win an award for, but if a lot of the people you want to connect with are going to these award nights, go along, talk to people, meet people, not without stalking, obviously, but just go to these events and, and, and really put yourself out there. It, I think, unfortunately, in society these days, we're, we're bringing people up to it all comes to you. It'll just happen for you. In the real world, that's not what happens. You've actually got to get out there and make it happen yourself. So don't wait at home for the phone to ring. Go out there, talk to people, meet people, mingle, network as much as you can. There are so many events, as I say, there's, um, there's breakfast events that go on, there's nighttime events that go on. Join them. Get out there and meet people and talk to people, and things will happen for you because your biggest selling strength is yourself. You are your biggest selling point yourself. Your resume looks okay, your work experience looks okay, your qualifications look nice on the wall, but your biggest tool of selling is yourself. If you can't sell yourself, you won't get anywhere. You've got to learn to sell yourself, and you can't do that sat at home. Absolutely. Would you say that would be the biggest antidote to AI? If you can go out, pound, some, pound the pavement, press some flesh, connect with people, and engage with other people, maybe you will keep the AI beast at bay. That's a strong possibility, and I can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And also, how can people get um, you know, in touch with you? You did mention uh, LinkedIn, and also uh, if you can also give us access to your website so people can see sure. the incredible stuff that you're doing there um, you know, at, at, at your recruitment agency. 
Yep. Our website is superiorpeople.com.au. They can go onto there. There's all our contact details on there, as well as all our job vacancies for advertising for those who are looking for work. Um, there's there's copies of all radio interviews I've done, TV interviews there on there as well. But certainly look for me on LinkedIn. We're very, very active on LinkedIn. We've put a lot of our stuff on LinkedIn out. Um, any media stuff goes on LinkedIn. So they can find me on there as well, yes. Absolutely. Well, I really, really, really had a good time having a chat with you there, Graham. But I have one last question um, that I just needed to find out from you. Now, we've spoken AI, we've spoken the traditional way of doing things, we've spoken, um, you know, just how people can stay you know, uh, above board, so to speak, in order for not to be replaced by um, this um, artificial sort of intelligence. What what do you actually see the future uh, looking like in terms of, first of all, in the recruitment sort of sector and just the workplace as, as a whole, you know, in reference to what we've just been speaking about? Look, AI will certainly change things. There's no doubt about it. It's going to sort of change the workplace a little bit. But I think also COVID has done the same thing with the work from home options now, and which I'm not a big fan of myself, but there's a lot of companies going down that path, the work from home option. So that's changing the workplace. So the office space is no longer what it used to be because it will be quieter than it used to be, so less people. So it's completely changing everything. I think, though, over a period of time, I think a lot of that work from home will ease off and i think more people will go back to the office eventually i do i do think that will happen i think as far as technology goes it will replace certain jobs it will replace functions the question you always have to ask yourself just because it can do something should i do it and i think a lot of people just because it can do it and the example i'll give you i'm, I'm an android phone user I've, I've, I've gone to the dark side and tried the apple i did try it for about six weeks. And seriously, I hated it. Absolutely hated it. So I went back to the Android. Now, people say, why? I said, because I want a phone. I don't want a toy. And it's like, but Apple can do this. And I said, but just because it can doesn't mean I have to do that. I don't want to do that. I just want a phone. So I'm back to my Samsung Android. It's a beautiful phone. And it does things that the Apple can't do. Things that I really like, it can't do. So just because something is new and it's technology and can do things doesn't mean it's better. So just be careful of technology. Don't assume it's always better. And, and as an analogy, I'll give you on AI, with people, etc. There are many, many dating sites out there, with Tinders and all those kinds of things, who use AI to try and match people together. How many of those relationships actually work? Not many. <laughs> so even though AI can help in recruitment, it's not it's not going to be a solution as far as I can see because it doesn't it can't match people. Absolutely, I really had uh, you know it was an amazing pleasure to to hear your perspective in this and just to hear where you've been and what it is that you're doing and what we can expect maybe we should bring you in again for another episode where we're talking apple and android because you did raise <laughs> yet another controversial um subject there graham you're a controversial man aren't you <laughs> <laughs> not intentionally it just happens <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Graham, for sharing your expertise and insights on recruitment, employment and the future of work. It's been a pleasure um, having you on the show. And before we wrap up, is there any final message or advice that you think you should leave our audience with? Look, I would say at the moment, the job market is the most challenging it's ever been to find people. There's a lot of work out there at the moment. So I would say to people, if you're genuinely looking for work or contemplating looking for work now is the best time because seriously every recruiter will tell you we cannot find people so now is the ideal time to get out there if you're currently working you're not sure you're happy there shop around there is so much work out there right now. and in 12 months time that won't be the case so now is the time to take action absolutely and as graham would have said people 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 Right. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And we hope you found this conversation with Graham 
enlightening and valuable. And if you want to learn more about superior people uh, recruitment and Graham's work, be sure to visit their website. I will make sure all the information is in the show notes there. And remember, success and prosperity are within your reach. Until next time, I'm Prosper Taruinga. And uh, on behalf of my guest, Graham, we wish you a prosperous journey ahead. Bye for now.